Today we're going to talk about optical coherence tomography. And I've been criticized in the past that I don't show much microscopy images in our microscopy course. So here it is. These are, if you Google OCT image or Bing or whatever, you'll get thousands and thousands of images. But how many of you know what OCT is? We have the experts in the room, except she's somewhere. So optical coherence tomography was developed in 1991, and it had an immediate application in the eye because it allowed depth sectioning without actually physical, physically sectioning the sample, which always is a benefit, right? So you're going to see... You see how many, these are images from probably different groups, but you are going to always see this type of image. So this is the uh, a retina image, a cross section, so this is Z and X. And what was very impressive from day one was that they were able to resolve these uh, layers in the retina and actually find disorders when these layers would be disruptive. Uh, and there was no way to do it otherwise. So it was an instant success. It was adopted in ophthalmology, still the main application, main market. Uh, but in the meantime, OCT has been kind of used or explored for other applications, including cardiovascular imaging, uh, cancer margin detections. Some of Professor Steve Bopart's group is looking at those. Um, yeah, so it's one of the success stories in biophotonics. And now, to go, back, to go back to the actual science of it, the main uh, achievement in OCT, in my opinion, is the fact that the Z sectioning, the resolution, the axial resolution in Z, is decoupled from the resolution in X and Y. So remember when we looked at a regular microscope, your resolution X and Y always de depends on numerical aperture. In confocal, focus the light down, you know, the higher the resolution X and Y, the tighter the depth of field will also be, right? Meaning, if you focus it tight in X and Y, it's going to be focused tight in Z as well. Which means that it limits the depth over which you can actually collect information at one time. In OCT, <coughs> this connection is broken. The Z information comes from actually um, looking at the coherence properties of the light. In other words, the Z resolution will give it, be given by the coherence length of the field. Nothing to do with DNA. That means you can have a zero NA illumination and still have depth sectioning in OCT, which is not true for any other microscope. So this is one big achievement because now it allows you to image with mild NA, meaning large depth of fields like the retina I showed you, with pretty good resolution in Z. Okay? It is a label-free technique. It relies on scattering. We're going to see how that works. It's actually, it's always in backscattering geometry, and it does not require labels. Um, and again, it is used as a complementary or an improvement of a confocal when it comes to uh, depth imaging because of this decoupling that I just mentioned. So the principle is low coherence interferometry. So the reason optical coherence tomography works is the key word is this coherence part of it. The reason it works is that we don't use narrow band lasers, monochromatic light. We actually use very broad spectra. So the typical experiment of, uh, experimental setup for OCT looks like this. The bare bones is actually a Michelson interferometer of the kind that we've seen before. You have a source. You have a bin splitter. Half of it goes here. Half of it goes to the second mirror, let's say. The reflected light bounces off the bin splitter, goes through in the second case, and the two fields are overlapped at the detector. When you overlap two fields, basically that is an interference. And now, in order to modulate, to control the delay between the two waves, one mirror 
is actually shifted around. It's mobile. So it can be shifted at different positions, Z. So the question is, what do we measure if we have a very narrow band laser versus an LED versus white light? These are not to scale. The laser should have been much thinner. Okay. Do you know what coherence length is, roughly? The meaning of it. We're going to define it quantitatively in a second. But in this particular setup, the coherence length will be the distance that I can mismatch the waves, the two fields, and still get significant interference. Okay? So if you have monochromatic light, the two fields can be essentially shifted over arbitrary, could, could be mismatched in paths over arbitrary distances. Because monochromatic light means it's a cosine that goes from minus infinity to infinity. Doesn't matter the shift between the two. You'll always get interference. Once the spectrum becomes finite, you move from a monochromatic field to something like an LED. An LED has a typical coherence length, could be 10, 20 microns. It means once you shifted the distance between the two by more than that, the interference goes down significantly. You may wonder what's the coherence length of this particular broad spectrum light, this white light. It turns out it's of the order of a micron. So if I take this light and somehow make an interference with it, I split it and put it back together, I have to match those two replicas within a micron, otherwise I don't see interference. Okay? That is the coherence length. So somehow we're going to learn today how this, which appears to be a bad thing, right? It could be a bad thing if you do experiments of, for example, tracking airplanes in the sky, interferometrically, which is a real thing. What, to increase sensitivity, what you have is you send the subject, the sample beam, let's say, to the skies, and then you have a reference beam, a coil of fiber that stays right here. So in that case, because you cannot control the position with the micros, you better have a very, very narrow, very long coherence length light, very monochromatic light. So in that case, you don't want wide light, clearly, right? But for this particular type of application, actually, you want the opposite. You want very broad spectrum. That coherence length will actually act as an optical sectioning mechanism that we'll be using to look through tissue in Z, OK? So the formula for this should be coherence length. The formula for coherence length is, is of the order, I mean, if you look at many publications, this coefficient in from varies. It could be anywhere from 1 to 2 point something, pi square root, blah, blah, blah. It's of the order of lambda square, where lambda is the mean wavelength of the spectrum, yeah, divided by the bandwidth. So the larger the bandwidth, the shorter the coherence length. The reason this coefficient in from varies is because many people use different conventions for what we call, when do you say that you run out of fringes? When do you say your fringes are low? Is it when they decay by 1 over e, by 1 over half, by 1 over e squared, half width, full width, blah, 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 many conventions, right? It's the exact same problem with resolution, right? Remember, you, I have my PSF, looks like this. What do I call resolution? So Rayleigh said, OK, forget about all this nonsense. It's going to be the first zero. Forget about the rest, OK? So it's kind of, we need that, that kind of convention. But this is a factor of order one. What I want you to remember is that it's lambda square at the top, delta lambda at the bottom. The fatter the spectrum, the shorter the coherence length, OK? OK, so let's look at it more carefully now, since we are experts on interferometry. Basically, I have the total field at the detector will be the summation between one field and the other field that is actually shifted by delay tau. This is introduced by the mirror, right? So if I notice, if I move the mirror, let's say they are matched over here, the two mirrors, but I shift this one somehow over here. I shift it by delta z. What will be the time delay tau in this case? Hmm? Delta Z. Two delta Z, that's what I was going after. So tau will be 
it's exactly the time it takes for the light to go through delta z, except it goes back and forth, right? So it goes once and then twice. So altogether, it's actually two delta z over the speed of light, where in air, so it's just c. So really, the mirror is acting as a time delay tuner, if you want. You control the time delay. So, once we know that, my detector, as you know, integrates over many cycles, of many periods of the light. It's so much slower than the frequency of the light. So, it was, it's going to do a time average over the magnitude square of that. But because we have an interference, we have a cross term. So we have the intensities as usual. And then U1, U2 conjugate plus U1 conjugate U2, a time average. And this really looks like a cross-correlation function, right? It is exactly a cross-correlation function. You have one field, the other field shifted at a particular delay tau, and then average over t. That's exactly the temporal correlation, the cross-correlation function gamma 1, 2. And because I have gamma 1, 2 and gamma 1, 2 complex conjugate, Really what we are measuring is two times the real part of the cross-correlation function. Is this okay? So the only difference with what we've done before and what we've seen many, many times is that you're used to seeing here maybe square root of i1, i2, and then cosine omega tau, that's it. Right? We've seen that before. What is different now is that we're trying to understand how this interference looks like for a broadband spectrum, no longer just monochromatic light. Okay, it's not a simple cosine. It will be some kind of cosine due to the argument of this. So gamma will be a magnitude and a phase, but because uh, the spectrum has a finite width, gamma will have a finite width, and therefore we're going to get the cosine with some kind of an envelope due to gamma itself, the amplitude of gamma. That's the difference with respect to what you've seen many times before, just a simple cosine. This is low coherence light. OK? Uh, OK, the average is sometimes I forget to divide by the length of the thing. So the units don't add up. All right. What is gamma 1, 2 with respect in the frequency domain? Well, the Fourier transform of gamma 1, 2 of a cross-correlation function is another function we call W1, 2. It's called cross-spectral density. So this Fourier transform exists. It gives you a complex function. W12 is called cross spectral density. Okay, so it's fields uh, both in the omega domain, but there are two different fields. So notice, if my interferometer splits the beam perfectly into identical replica of the field, they're identical on both sides. When I put them back together, this W12 becomes the spectrum. This becomes just U1, U1 conjugate. That is the spectrum of omega. Are you with me? Very simple. So what does this mean? It means, first of all, no sample, so identical replicas on both sides. I move one mirror while my detector is detecting the signal, the interference signal. I scan from some minus tau to plus tau. I record the gamma, gamma 1, 2. Because it's the same u1, u2 are the same, then you get some kind of gamma, 1, 1. It's an autocorrelation factor. But the Fourier transform of that gives you spectrum. Do you know what that is? This is the principle of Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, FTIR. As simple as that. 
because the autocorrelation function is related to the spectrum through a simple Fourier transform. In other words, my autocorrelation function has all the spectral information that there is to be known in it. I can choose to measure actually optical spectrum in the time domain. Usually, how do we measure spectra? We take the light, we put a prism or something, right? We spread it, right? That's how your cell phone works. You ignoring me? Your sensor, your spectroscopic sensor, you have some kind of grating, right? For a prism. I'm talking to you, Caitlin. So you have a grating or a prism, right? That does spectroscopy. Okay, say yes or not or something. Okay, so that's the regular way of doing spectroscopy, which is fine. But sometimes you can actually measure in the time domain with some advantages. So instead of recording color by color, so what the great thing, what does, what does it do? It splits angle versus wavelength, right? So red will be split here, blue will be split here. If I measure versus angle, I convert to wavelength, I'm done. This is a more subtle way of doing things. You actually use this interferometer. You scan this mirror. Your signal here looks like it has some kind of an oscillation. It has a fringe, right? An envelope and a phase. Whatever it is, if we transform it numerically, it's going to give you the spectrum just like that. And there are reasons, there are applications when this is actually advantageous. In particular, if I were in the business of measuring spectra, what would be the spectral resolution? What will define the spectral resolution of S of omega? So for the regular dispersion spectrometers where you have a grating, it will depend on how fine the grating is, how many of those grooves you are actually illuminating. Okay, so it's something to do with how dispersive that element is. Right? What is, so coarser grading will give you low resolution, or fine grading will give you good resolution. What do you think defines the resolution of this measurement here? Huh? Yes. More precisely, meaning I just wait and sit there for an hour, and I'm going to get higher resolution, or? Yes. Exactly right. So remember, if I want something small in one domain, the other domain has to be big. In this particular case, I want omega to be small. Fine sampling in omega means the tau range has to be huge. So you see, one difference with respect to the dispersive elements is that if I build my interferometer and now I scan over really long z's, then my resolution will go up indefinitely. And actually, as a rule of thumb, your final resolution delta lambda over lambda, not, so this is the, the resolution, the smallest interval you can measure, is of the order of lambda over delta z. Think about that for a second. If this is a micron, and I move my z over a millimeter, I'm already doing one of a thousand. I'm already doing one nanometer resolution over one millimeter. What if you do it over a meter? Right? That's a thousand more. That's 10 to minus 3 nanometers. That's pretty good already. Very nice. Very hard to do it with the grating. OK, so I wanted you to realize actually how simple the principle of FTIR is. Right? It relies on this knowledge that Temporal autocorrelation and power spectrum are really the same thing. They're represent two representations of the same thing. So you can uh, measure one versus the other. It turns out OCT is doing the exact opposite thing. Um, there is one version of OCT that is called frequency domain where it's doing exactly this, measuring the spectral domain with the grating and the spectrometer, and then getting to gamma, getting to the autocorrelation, and then convert that to depth, because tau is z, okay? 
But I'm getting ahead of, uh, uh, of myself, so that's for later. I'm going to tell you all about that. Okay, for now, keep in mind this relationship, very simple relationship, but actually very useful. So here's what you measure at the detector. If you have a very broad spectrum, and this is, this is an exaggeration, okay? Even this white light will give you more fringes here. But bear with me. The, the signal that you measure at the detector, as I'm scanning the mirror, as I'm scanning that tau, is like this. If I move all the way to minus infinity, the two beams are mismatched by a lot. I get no interference. I get only I1, I2, I1 plus I2, as if they are completely incoherent, right? So I get nothing. Once I approach the point of zero shift between the two, an envelope starts to rise and my fringes start to show up. I get a maximum contrast at the origin, clearly, when the two are perfectly matched. And then if I pass that, it's going to decay symmetrically. Okay? So basically, a DC, let's say, of one, a maximum intensity of two, right? And a minimum of zero. So this is what comes out of your detector. This is not your gamma. It has the I1, I2. It has the DC. So basically what you need to do is to remove the DC, put this right thing here. This is the real part of your gamma. So since gamma of tau has a magnitude, which is really this envelope here, That's a little much, okay. So this envelope right here is the magnitude of gamma. And then it has a certain phase of tau, which is nothing more but the average frequency times tau. I'll get back to that. So when you take the real part of gamma, not surprisingly, you get whatever the magnitude, and then you get some cosine of omega naught tau. <coughs> this is why you get this envelope, and on top you get this modulation, which is a pure cosine. How do I know that this is omega naught is the mean frequency of the light? Well, it's all from the from the Fourier relationship that we looked at earlier. So it's from here. So if your spectrum looks like this, and this is the spectrum of my light, could be an LED, whatever it is, it is centered at omega naught. We're talking about doing the Fourier transform. So gamma of tau is the Fourier transform of this S of omega minus omega naught, right? I should call it S prime, right? S and S prime are not the same. This is shifted here, right? So S prime is the zero frequency. It's, it's the one shifted at the origin. This would be your S prime. Yeah? So I can express my S as an S prime of omega minus omega naught, simply shifted. Why do I want to shift it? Because I want you to see what this does to my Fourier transform. So what's going to be? It's going to be the, according to the shift theorem, it's going to be the Fourier transform of S prime of omega, unshifted, times e to the i omega naught tau. That's it. This is a very remarkable result, as simple as it looks. But it's still confusing a lot of people, actually, optics people that don't work with interferometry. It says that even if you get the broader spectrum, like including this one, broader spectrum light, you will get fringes of interference. Even though there is so many colors in this light, you will get fringes. The fringe will oscillate exactly at the mean frequency of your spectrum so then your, your question could be, okay, so 
where is the influence of the spectra showing up? How is this different from a laser? This is perfectly equivalent to a laser, monochromatic at omega naught, at the mean frequency of the light. So how is the fact that I have a broad spectrum manifesting itself in my interferogram? It's all in here. So the low coherence part of the field shows up in the envelope. So this oscillation looks like as if I have a monochromatic laser, except the broad spectrum part of it, it cuts that down, it narrows the range over which that fringe exists to something very finite. Right? So if this was a monochromatic laser, this will go, the envelope will be perfectly flat. It will go like a cosine forever. The moment you broaden the spectrum, the envelope of gamma does the opposite, comes down, right? That's what happens here. Are we clear on this? Because I get questions, for example, after my talks. We happen to work with wide light interferometry. And many people come to me and say, which phase shift are you talking about when you're using wide light? OK? So what happens is a click somehow in our minds that because this is a broad spectrum, we tend to think in the frequency domain. So you have, oh, so I have red, I have blue, I have a million different colors, each with their own shift, right? True. The only difference is we are looking in the time domain. This is a time domain quantity where you're looking at the average effect of all those sinusoids added together. So on the previous equation, um, which term would be the envelope? Here? Yeah. This is the envelope. This is, this is the Fourier transform of the envelope of S, you see. So for example, if I have a sinusoid that, uh, I'm sorry, a Gaussian, a spectrum that is Gaussian, happens to be shifted at omega naught, what this says is the autocorrelation of that thing is Fourier transform of the Gaussian times the modulation due to the shift, the modulation due to where the mean frequency is, OK? It's possible to have, I guess, unshifted light. You have, you can have light around zero. Right? Oh. That's called DC. That's your battery. Yeah. Are we good? So we unraveled a lot of physics for very little math. You see, just by using the shift theorem. And this is actually a very important concept that adding many different frequencies, yes, they do have their own phase shifts. But when you look in the time domain, what you're looking at is actually the average effect of all those colors. And it turns out the average effect of that is to oscillate at the particular frequency that happens to be the mean frequency of that light. People in fiber optic communications, know all this. And pulse, like fast, ultra fast optics, people like Gary Eden type people, that I'm sure you all know this. You know that you have a pulse that propagates, it has a carrier, it has an envelope. It's all about the same thing, except we're looking at correlations. Here's something to remember also. If you ever wonder, what will be the average monochromatic field if I have a given spectrum, let's think about that for a second. I ask this question. I have a bunch of colors coming out of this light. I can think of it as an ensemble of perfectly monochromatic light, right? They have their own phases, whatever. What's the average omega in that case? Oh, I'm sorry, what's the average wave? What would be the average e to the i omega t? How would you do that? Use MATLAB. <laughs> you can always use MATLAB, <laughs> yes, to do that. And to do what? Uh, well, you could, you could yeah, put a grading and then measure each color and then kind of weight that. Okay, so what, what, what does that give you? 
spectrum. It gives you the spectrum. But that's my answer. So forget MATLAB. I'm trying to use words. So what you want to do is to get each individual color and weigh it properly. That's an average. That's an ensemble average. I need to weigh it properly. What's the proper weighting factor? It's exactly the spectrum. That tells you how much power of that omega frequency you have. So the spectrum that I measure, I have to divide it by S of omega to make it integral of omega. So I make it the probability density, let's say, small s. And then the average monochromatic light will be integral of S of omega, or little s, sorry, is the average of the thing I want to do the average over, e to the i omega t, multiply by its weight, the omega. This is a definition. This is not even, this is a definition of an ensemble average of this quantity. With this being the probability, this tells you how much of each color you have. And what is this? It's a free dress. This is gamma. So you can think of the autocorrelation function as the ensemble average monochromatic wave, if you want. In other words, what does that mean, ensemble? It means how would the group behave like, the whole ensemble, if I average over all of them. That's exactly the, the meaning of what we're getting here. OK? So the low coherence part of the light, again, manifests itself in the envelope you still get these fringes, even for the broader spectrum like this, over that one micron. So this will define the coherence length, the width of this thing, of the envelope. Over that width, I'm, get, I'm getting very high contrast fringes, as if I have a laser. OK? Are you OK with this idea? So, here's a quick refresher on the Hilbert transform that we've done before. You did the homework on that in the spatial domain. I want you to, to understand one thing, that we always measure real stuff, right, in the lab. The detector gives you real signals. There's nothing complex. But we like to use complex analytic signals because that kind of simplifies our calculations a lot. So in this particular case, what we measure is actually not gamma, but the real part of gamma, because we're measuring actually this oscillation, which is the cosine part of the signal. How do you get the gamma itself? You do a Hilbert transform, the way we did it for off-axis interferometry, if you remember, right? So in that, do you guys remember anything from that homework when you did the MATLAB? Yeah? Alex? Yeah. Okay. So in that case, what did we have? We had fringes in space, right? So you had one-dimensional fringes or at your CCD camera. I gave you that data, and you did the Hilbert transform. And this is the exact same thing, except it's in time. Yeah? So basically, that's what we mean when we say phase of gamma. We mean the phase associated with the complex analytic signal of the experimental, experimentally measured quantity, OK? But in, in real life, we never say that, oh, I'm measuring the phase of the complex analytics. Yeah. The colleagues will point fingers at you. But I want you to remember that we actually measure real things. When we talk about phase, what we mean is the phase of a complex analytic signal associated with that real thing. OK. OK, so that's where the gamma shape is. Uh, coming from, OK. Let's take a look now at what, what can affect in real life the, the way the fringes look like. The simplest, um, the simplest, the simplest way to alter my fringes, uh, and most common, is to have unbalanced dispersion in my interferometer. So if you have two beams interfering, imagine one has a piece of glass and one doesn't. The light in one beam on one arm goes through more glass than the other one. 
You understand what dispersion means, right? What is dispersion? Dispersion is the change of refractive index with frequency. Basically, if you have a certain material that has resonances, omega 1, omega 2, blah, 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 so it absorbs very strongly at these particular frequencies. Right? So it could be electronic transitions in UV and visible. So I'm able to push, to excite to a new electronic transition. The molecule absorbs a lot of light there, resonantly, resonantly absorbs at that particular frequency. It could be vibrational, right? So all FTIR is done in the near infrared because that's where the spectrum for vibrations is. Uh, all rotation. They all give you resonances. So if you tune your frequency exactly at that particular energy level shift, the molecule will absorb resonantly, right? It's like the classic problem with the swing. There's a particular frequency. It will, you will be able to break, break the swing if you pump it at that particular frequency, right? Do you know the story with the bridge and the soldiers? You do, right? You do. No? I thought you nodded. You don't know? You haven't heard this? It has a name, but I forget. So... That didn't really happen? I thought it was just... You thought it was a myth? I like to think it happened. I don't know. It's not important. But every material has a particular resonance. So, something to do with the way it sounds. So this one is not a very good resonator, right? Compared to the string of your guitar. But anyway, imagine now a bridge has its own vibration. Actually, it's scary. Sometimes you can see in high winds, you can see bridges doing this, right? So the story is that there was this, this um, platoon or whatever of soldiers marching up. And unfortunately, they happened to march at that particular frequency. And they put the more and more energy into the bridge until it collapsed. OK, so same story here. Absorption is very easy to understand. What happens is, because the real Absorption is the imaginary part of a response function. It's the imaginary part of a refractive index. Okay, so I'm trying to review what dispersion is. It seems like you're looking a little puzzled because you didn't take the prerequisite 460. So here's where the absorption is coming from. If I'm writing a plane wave as e to the r n of omega k naught times z, if I'm Splitting in terms of real and imaginary part. You notice that the i from here with the i from here gives you e to the minus n w of n double, what do you call this? The second, whatever, k naught z double prime. e to the i n prime k naught z. So this is the absorption part, it's an exponential decay which is nothing more but Lambert-Beer's law. That's where it's coming from. It comes from the imaginary part of the refractive index, right? It, ha it has something to do with this curve, where you are on this curve. So if you're close to the resonance, this will become very big, right? This is an double prime. And the oscillation part, the phase part, is in the real part of n. And the beautiful thing is, n prime and n double prime are related through, guess? Hmm? OK, but mathematically, what is it? Kramer's crowning, I think I, we have some experts in the room. Is that what you mean? It's this integral over and over again. 
that relates the real part of something and the imaginary part of something. Are you guys with me or not really? This time domain relationship between gamma, real part of gamma, and imaginary part of gamma exists because we cut off all the omegas that are negative, we chop them off. So if you have a spectrum, I don't know, that looks like this, you say all the information in the negative frequency is redundant with the one in the positive frequencies. I cut this off, the Fourier transform of this becomes complex. The real part will be my original signal, the imaginary part will be related because I don't generate new information. It's the same information, they better be related. The way they are related is through the Hilbert transform. Now, what if I have my, this relationship in the frequency domain? Well, in the frequency domain, it means that I'm going to have n double prime of omega. It should be in terms of epsilon, actually, but OK. It's the Hilbert transform of n prime of omega. Where is this coming from? It comes from the fact that now all the signal when time is smaller than 0 is cut off. This says I remove all the response of my signal that appears before I apply my impulse. What is that called? Causality. Thank you. My system is causal. I remove all the response at negative times. Boom, all of a sudden what this gives me is actually a relationship between real and imaginary part of the frequency domain response. This happens in mechanics too. The viscosity and elasticity that I told you in dynamic light scattering is also, they are both related. Viscosity versus frequency and elasticity versus, fre versus frequencies are related through a Hilbert transform just because that system is causal too. You cannot have a response before you apply the impulse. Is that making things more clear or worse? Better? So, OK. So now we're talking about this. This is the absorption part. Very easy to understand. I have a bell-shaped type thing, right? If the molecule is, isolate, is isolated, no other effects. What's that shape looking like? Lorentzian, thank you. Wow, you guys know stuff. Lorentzian, natural line width. Okay, so now the trick question is how would my n prime look like? We just kind of proved that they must be related. Well, it turns out it looks like this. They will, all, they will kind of fluctuate or vary around n equal 1, which is the vacuum response, right? So it looks like this. It goes up, goes down at the resonance, and then comes back again. So I'm, going to, I'm drawing only the big ones because it's easier to see. So again, starts from above 1. Way outside the resonance, n is very close to 1. And it's very flat with frequency. You see? Not much variation with frequency. Very low dispersion. As I approach the resonance, do, 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 this starts to increase. My variation n prime versus omega goes up. But then it switches to this weird slope, negative slope right around, your, uh, around the resonance, and then it tilts back up, and approaches 1 from below. You get n below 1, and at infinity goes back to 1, but now from below 1. Yeah? But then dispersion goes down again. 
So see, this is constant. It's constant with respect to frequency. Dn at the omega is zero. Dn at the omega here is zero. Dn at the omega positive, Dn at the omega positive on both sides becomes negative right in the middle. This is called normal dispersion. This is called anomalous dispersion. Because it's weird. In general, you expect higher frequencies to be delayed more? Yes. Yes. Unless you are at that weird place where that material absorbs. So, rule of thumb, if your material, we're talking glass, we're talking optical components. Chances are people were not stupid, they didn't make them at the resonance, otherwise they will look black. They will be <laughs> absorbing a lot, right? So, mo chances are your thing is transparent, beam splitter lenses, right? Unless you are into some weird experiment. So, in that case, your dispersion is positive. Most likely your blue, uh, right, will have higher refractive index than red. You can tell if it looks transparent at that particular wavelength. Okay? The closer you are to resonance, uh, glass, as you know, has resonances in UV, and sometimes very close to visible. Depending on how close you are to that resonance, the dispersion could be very high or very low. And it's never zero, unfortunately, and this is coming back to our OCT. It's never zero. Um, so that's why you pay the money sometimes to make doublets, sandwich two different lenses, to compensate for those chromatic aberrations. Right? So in a microscope, this is terrible. If you have N versus omega as a strong dependence, it means that if you make a microscope with that material, right, it's going to focus the red light is going to be focused here, and then the blue light is going to be focused here. Right? So your image is going to show colors which might be fun for a second, but then you realize actually you're smearing the information of yourselves, right? It's, that's how the original microscopes used to be. Colors everywhere look terrible. But now, with the high performance objectives, we're pretty good. Now the, the images look really actually crisp for all colors, but you pay the money in that objective where what they do is sandwich 10, 12 different lenses to compensate for this N of omega. So one is positive lens combined with a negative lens and so on, and which is like that different materials and all that. Okay, so are we clear where the dispersion is coming from, the physics of it, right? It's coming from the fact that the real and imaginary parts of this response, of optical response, they're related. When you have strong dependence on absorption, so closer to resonance, there is something very st of a st very strong dependence of the real part of what we usually call refractive index, right? When you say refractive index, my glass is 1.5, what we really mean is M prime. We never say, oh, my glasses are 1.5 plus 10 to minus 3i, right? <laughs> we never say that. But it should be there. Okay? So the problem with my interferometer is actually this curve that's not flat where my this derivative is actually significant, where n varies with omega significant. So let's take a look at what this simple thing does to my interferogram, which I think is remarkable. So keep in mind, for example, the same dispersion affects how we send information on fiber optics. It's actually the same phenomenon that affects your interferogram in OCT versus how the pulses are actually starting, they're starting to spread. They become fatter and fatter if your fiber has high dispersion. And the science went into making that material for the fiber optics of very, very low dispersion. It's incredible, actually. That is, uh, remember, at the bottom of the ocean, we have thousands of miles of this optical fiber, and still, the signal is repeated once in a while and amplified and so on, but the dispersion is so low that actually the pulses stay together for a long, many, many miles. Once in a while they're compensated, but, okay? So it's a real issue. But now let's take a look at exactly what, what it does. Okay, so I wanted to start with this more of a historical aspect because Michelson himself, without knowing any 
Kramer scrolling without knowing any coherence theory. It, this is 1870s, something like that. He understood the effects of dispersion just like we know it today. In his case, his interferometer was basically like this. A beam splitter, mirror here, mirror here, moved one mirror back and forth, and you silver the one facet of this piece of glass. That's how you make beam splitters. So what happens is, this beam, okay, you, we silvered this one, sorry. So we silver this one. So the light goes in, goes through the beam splitter, goes to the mirror, comes back, reflects off the mirror, goes to the detector. So this one went through the glass once. Hmm. However, this one, the top one, went through the glass once. Twice, goes up, comes back one more time, and then goes back to the detector. So the top one went through three times. So there is a difference of 2L in one beam versus the other one. And the phase versus omega looks like this, which is basically 2 times N of omega K naught times L. My question is now, what we're trying to do now is to figure out how is this going to affect the look of my fringes. So I'm going in the same experiment. I'm moving my mirror up and down. How are my fringes going to be any different? OK? So first, the way it's done in fiber optic communications also is to look at particular um, kind of terms in this. Do a Taylor expansion as a function of omega and pick these terms one by one. It's kind of how they do aberrations in microscopy, right? Like spherical aberration, blah, blah. They give them names. These are really just different terms in the Taylor <coughs> expansion or Zernike polynomials. By the way, dispersion n versus omega is nothing more but aberration. So phase, e to the i phase versus omega is the analogous to e to the i phase of k. So this is what we call dispersion. This is what we call aberrations in imaging. It's all about the spectral phase. Are you with me? So dispersion is basically how your pulse, for example, gets aberrated in the time domain. It's the exact same problem. The math is actually the same. as in aberrations in the spatial domain. It's all about the spectral phase. So you mess with the phases in, the, in K, in the frequency domain, you are going to alter the look of that function in the spatial domain, in the yeah, spectral frequency, spatial frequencies to the spatial domain. Temporal frequencies to the time domain. Mm -hmm. OK, so let's expand this phi of omega. So around the average frequency omega. So I have phi of, phi not, uh, phi of omega naught. DK at the omega is the linear term. Second order term, and you have more terms. But to me, just to illustrate the effects, I think these three terms are enough. First of all, this is very benign. It's a constant. Nobody cares. Um, dk at the omega is basically 1 over the group velocity. This is a definition for it. That is nothing more but the group velocity. It tells you how this, what's the kind of the velocity of the group. What it means is, what's the velocity of that envelope? So if you have a pulse, that looks like this. This velocity of the envelope will be the group. This will be the phase. So in special situations, these may slip with respect to one another. The phase and group velocity might be different. 
this happens exactly in dispersion condition. When there is no dispersion, dispersion is negligible, they go together. Which means that in air, if I launch a pulse in air, each color will travel at the same speed, right? So you have a group of colors traveling together. If the speed doesn't change versus colors, they will travel as a group, right? Like soldiers. If you have a well-organized the Navy, the Navy SEALs going in group, they always stay together, okay? If you get the, let's say, Romanian army, because I'm from Romania, I can make fun of that. After a while, they kind of spread around and they lose coherence, right? So that happens in a material where the color, uh, the velocity depends on color. So clearly, if I have a nice pulse packed with colors that are locked in together, if each color will start to have different velocity, they're going to spread around. That's very simple, okay? So that's the meaning of the group velocity. And then the most interesting part, and at the same time the most annoying and challenging to deal with, is the group velocity dispersion. So this actually tells you how the pulse is spreading. Okay? It's telling you how the group velocity changes with color. So that is the problem. Okay? Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's calculate, just do an honest job to calculate the effect for each pulse. So we're going to put e to the i5 of omega in our um, cross-spectral density. Right? So this is the U1, U2 conjugate. I'm going to have a difference. The difference between the two beams is, is, is exactly in this, cross spectral, in this phase, spectral phase. And I'm going to look at how each term affects the Fourier transfer, the time domain. That's all we're doing. So I take U1, U1 conjugate. So the two beams are identical except for this. The one went through the beam splitter twice, which shows as e to the i phi of omega. These two actually gives me the original spectrum. So the only difference really is that I have my spectrum but is now aberrated with this phase. So I put in my phi of omega, it's e to the i phi omega naught. This is the zero order term, first order term, second order term. So I think I took them one by one to make it very clear. Okay, so notice this does, when I take the Fourier transform, this is really a constant that goes in front. Nobody really cares about it. Okay? So let's take a look at the second term. Okay, so free transform gets you this in front. We ignore it. So this tells you how my, how my fringes are going to look like, right? Gamma 1, 2 of tau. So basically, my spectrum <coughs> is S prime of omega minus omega naught that we had before. This is the first order term with the group velocity. E to the minus i omega t, so Fourier transfer of this whole thing. Okay, I think I took this constant in front again, we don't care. Uh, yeah, omega naught is a constant, so it comes in front. So it's the Fourier transfer of this. <coughs> so in order to change the variable and make the Fourier of omega minus omega naught, I have to add here an omega naught. You see it? I have to add here another delay. So it's I omega minus omega naught tau, which was from here, minus 2L over VG. So that comes from here. You see what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to change the variable to omega minus omega naught. So I'm trying to add here an omega naught. So it actually looks like this. So it looks like a Fourier transform with respect to omega minus omega naught, except now the variable, the time variable is going to be tau minus this thing. So what we get at the end of the day is the Fourier transform um, of, of the cross spectral density is what I had before. This is magnitude of gamma. Looks exactly the same except it's shifted by 2L over group velocity. What does that mean? It's a very simple thing. It means if I put a piece of glass in front of one of my um, beams, my interferogram will shift, meaning I have to adjust my mirror to find my interference again. Right? In fact, when we're doing low coherence interferometry in my lab, when I was a, like you, a grad student, 
The worst thing you could do to your friend is to elbow the setup a little bit after you worked for like days to align. So local hands interrogatory means you bring the two arms together within 10 microns. Okay? So that's challenging. I mean, that, that's tough to do. And then you just flick one of the mirrors and everything goes to hell. You just have to start off. So that's exactly what happens here. You add a portion of glass or a piece of fiber, of course. Your envelope will be shifted. It means I need to adjust my mirror to find this again. But this is not a huge issue. This is the equivalent of defocusing in microscopy. You remember the fir that first order aberration? It was really a shift in Z. Right? So defocusing is not a real aberration, meaning I can fix it easily. I adjust my focus. It's the exact same is the analog of that. Adjust my mirror, I put it back in focus. The shape is the same. <coughs> That's the important part. And the carrier is the same. What is this 5 of omega doing here? 5 of omega not, okay, which is irrelevant. It's a concept. Um, okay, so the groove velocity term, no problem. Keeps the shape the same of the envelope. is just shifted as it should because I'm adding delay in front of it, right? So it's going to shift. Well, the problems actually arise with the group velocity dispersion. So that's the shift, okay. Group velocity dispersion term is essentially a Gaussian. What does this remind you of? Spherical. Huh? Spherical. Really? I mean, it's an approximation of a spherical wave, yes. What do we call it? What do we call this in the spatial domain? Who says for now? It's in my head. Nobody. <laughs> Fred, isn't this the Fresnel kernel? For God's sakes, the you know the the Gaussian. That's why we call it the Gaussian approximation, right? This is the equivalent of the Fresnel, meaning in the frequency domain is a product, right? Fourier transform is going to give me a convolution. So, I have this spectrum, I'm doing the same thing, I'm taking the Fourier transform, what do I get? Now, the cross correlation actually looks like my original one, except now it's convolved with this mass. So it's a Gaussian in tau, and the width of that Gaussian is proportional to beta 2, and L. So beta 2 is a material property. It's called GVD, group velocity dispersion. This is exactly the parameter that controls also the shape of your pulses, the spread of your pulses in communications. And of course, L. So the more material you add, the worse it's going to get, the, the fatter your function. Yeah? So notice, this changes the shape. In particular, it may make your cross correlation not only fatter, so it changes both the envelope and the phase. It may make it, it surely makes it fatter, but also changes the phase itself. It adds a term that's no longer just linear. It's not just omega naught tau. It could be omega naught tau plus something t squared. What does that mean? It's like angular acceleration. It means your frequency sweeps up or down. This is called, what is this called when your frequency goes up or down? Chirp. So the nice cosine that I had under the envelope, now it's actually either going up or going down. Positive chirp or negative chirp. That's why we call it chirp from the birds. Yeah? So you may wonder, okay, what is this to do with OCT and imaging and blah, blah, blah. It turns out that actually the resolution, the actual resolution will be given by the width of this envelope. I just told you in the beginning that the Z resolution 
is decoupled from the numerical aperture. All it depends on is actually the coherence length, the width of this envelope. I'm going to prove that to you next. So it's very important that dispersion is minimized such that this envelope sticks to its minimum, to absolute minimum possible. Any dispersion will make it worse. So going back to Michelson, he understood this without any Fourier, without anything. He noticed his fringes change if you have dispersion. And here's the solution. If I cannot remove these extra two trips on one of the beams, that's kind of impossible. What I can do is to add two more trips to the other one. So as smart as he was, Michelson took a piece of glass, identical to that, put it on the beam that had only one trip. Now it has one plus two, three. So it pretty much compensated almost entirely the dispersion difference. So. The interferometer only cares about what's on one arm and not on the other one. It doesn't matter that you have a kilometer of fiber on both. If it's the same kilometer, the interferometer doesn't know. Is that cool? So actually, in OCT, you have to do a lot of this dispersion compensation. Of course, it's more complicated than in Michelson's time because now you have fibers and you have optical components. And, and actually, there is dispersion that comes from the object itself. So you do the best you can to add, to cancel the dispersion, but it's never perfect. But I, it's, I think you can do a pretty good job minimizing it. So approaching that best theoretical best, which is approaching the autocorrelation function of the field. OK, so dispersion compensation is a real thing. Let me ask you one last thing before we move to actual OCT. Um, actually, the setup is here. OK, so this is my setup. <clears throat> it's no longer just a bin splitter with free space. Most OCT systems are fiber optics based. In fact, this contributed to the initial success of OCT because these are all fiber optic communication components. So these are, were all very high quality off the shelf <coughs> and cheap and using similar wavelengths like in communication. So OCT also operates on near field wavelengths. Uh, 1.33, sometimes 1.5, which is exactly on the uh, communication windows. Um, so these are single mode fibers, no longer free space. But I wanted to ask you something before we go to a city. So we just proved that if I have, let's say, an extra length of fiber on one arm versus <coughs> the other arm, I get these terms, and the worst one is the groove velocity dispersion that actually messes up. Both the envelope makes it um, broader and potentially may chirp my signal. What if, <clears throat> what if I do the autocorrelation of each arm? So let's say I put an extra piece of fiber on this, and then I autocorrelate this. So let's imagine I put this in an interferometer itself. Would the autocorrelation of this field care about this, of, of the extra fiber? Man, everything has something to do with quantum mechanics with you. What is it? it Sounds fancy, but no. <laughs> but tell me, why? In what sense? Because uh, I remember something like they're able to want to use this for secure communications. Like if you have uh, someone, some adversary trying to listen in on your communications, the state he coheres or something like that. I don't know if that's happening here. Bob and Eve? Yeah, something we asked you. Well, so for me, quantum mechanics starts to occur when you have very few photons, okay? when, when you are in the discrete regime. 
here, plenty of photons. So I, I don't know if it has anything to do with your problem. But let's assume we have a lot of power. We don't care about single photons at all. Question is very simple. I put a piece of, I measure the autocorrelation of this field without this piece of extra glass. I get something, gamma naught. Then I put the extra piece and I measure the autocorrelation of that field. Are they different or are they the same? Same. Same. So it only, it, it's only gamma 1, 2 that changes changes with dispersion and of omega. Gamma 1, 1, gamma 2, 2, constant. The coherence of each field does not change. It's only the cross correlation that changes. And this is sometimes, if you read papers on OCT, this is kind of uh, sometimes, uh, all the time, I would say, overlooked. Because it's always the expression is, the coherence of the light changes due to dispersion. No. The coherence of the light actually stays the same on each beam. It's the cross correlation that changes. You may hear, oh, the coherence length of the field changed. I know what you mean. So I know what those people mean is that the gamma 1, 2 got fatter, but that shouldn't be called coherence length, actually, if we are to be purists about it. It's, it's the cross correlation length. The coherence length on each beam is exactly what it was. It's the fact that you are cross correlating that makes the difference. OK, so keep that in mind. OK. So, as I said, OCT looks like this. These components were readily available in the early 90s, so this contributed to the progress. Um, <clears throat> I remember you could buy this thing for 200 bucks. Two fibers that were connected here in the middle, 50-50 beam splitter, very easy to set up. You can put this together in one afternoon. Fiber collimators, they screw into your fiber, gives you a collimated light, then you get from Tor Labs two mirrors. You're done with your interferometer in no time, like a few hours. Then you have to s search for matching that path length, which I mentioned to you. Um, so <clears throat> now, if we want to do imaging, clearly we replace the mirror with the object. This could be your eye, could be a piece of tissue of some sort. Let's say this is the eye, right? Let's say this is your lens inside your eye. So you want to do depth imaging in this uh, system. So let's see how it works. Well, it's always easier to start in the frequency domain. So we have the specimen or the sample field. We have the reference field. This times that conjugate. I'm going to assume that they are identical again for simplicity. There is no dispersion change, nothing. They are perfectly balanced except for the sample. So let's just simplify things. So the two beams are identical, except one goes to the eye, to your sample, and comes back. The other one goes to a mirror. So if that's the case, then basically I can put a function h tilde of omega, which sums up the effect of the object of your eye, whatever it might be. right? So then I get my original spectrum, and it's modified by the specimen, H. Yeah? So this is, if you like, this is a transfer function of my object. Now, I'm going into the time domain. So basically, in, time domain, in the time domain, I'm going to get my cross-correlation function, which is what I measure, remember, right? What I measure is the real part of this thing. This is going to be the autocorrelation function that I started with. The original autocorrelations function without the object, except the effect of the object is convolving it with h of tau, where h of tau is the function associated with the object, whatever that might be. Yeah? What does this look like? The output is the object, the input 
convolve with something. What is the impulse response of your imaging system? Remember, tau is proportional to z. Tau is actually depth. We're talking about input-output relation for a z imaging system. What is the impulse response? Impulse response is a function. Certain function. May have a width or something, but. I mean, it's this. This is your input, this is my object. Whatever that might be. Actually, even better, why don't we make h of tau equals delta? That's how we measure the, the impulse response. I make my impulse, I make my input an impulse. And I measure its response. Right? What's the meaning of an h of tau that's a delta function in tau? What's the meaning of an object that will give you a delta function in tau or z? Hmm? Bingo. Just a mirror. I think I have a picture here somewhere. Yeah. So this, oh, this is the sample. So this mirror gives you a reflection at a particular delay tau naught and nothing else. Not below, not above, right? So I mean z, not below, not above, just at the perfect position z naught. That is a delta function. So let's say my position is tau minus tau naught. So this is my delta, my object, my mirror is positioned at the particular tau naught which of course is something like z over 2z over c. What do you get? The output will be gamma of tau minus tau naught. So instead of a delta function, what you get is actually, if you plot the envelope of gamma, you get this broadening, as usual, with any microscope. Right, in a regular microscope, you get the spread in x, y. Here, you get the spread in time, which is actually spread in z. The width, which is actually my z resolution, is actually the width of my gamma. It is the coherence length. So z resolution is That's why we want gamma to be as narrow as possible. We want the spectrum to be as fat as possible. Because that's what gives me the Z resolution. Nothing to do with DNA. I can illuminate with zero NA, with a plane wave, and I will sti still get this. In fact, the precursor to OCT, local hands interferometry, is much older. OCT just took that concept and applied it to tissue imaging. But, for example, there were instruments, commercial instruments, for example, by HP, and I played with one of those for my PhD. He had a very nice instrument. It had the fiber optic input, no imaging, just a point measurement. And it was meant to detect defects inside either other fibers. So imagine your fiber has a crack. So you send light in. This reflects off. You put it in your interferometer here, uh, yeah, like that. So you adjust your mirror, and the moment the path length between your reference and the crack inside matches, you'll get the, the spike in interference. You see? So this was a very neat way to measure actually defects inside of a, an object without cutting it open which again is beneficial. Any waveguides, uh, so it was really very interesting. This was developed in the 80s, way before OCT. Put the same idea. So it's a way of actually localizing, not only detecting, but you can tell this is actually within your fiber at these many microns inside with a resolution plus or minus microhairs length. 
or coherence length over two, something like that. And here, there is no numerical aperture. Numerical aperture is pretty much very small. It's whatever the fiber can carry, right? Single mode fiber, very low angle. But the depth resolution is given by the spectrum, by how broad the spectrum is, how narrow, how short the coherence length is. Yeah? Okay.